These last few weeks, North America has been rocked by some crazy snowstorms. And with climate change taking a serious toll, it feels like every year our urban infrastructure, in particular our transit, faces greater and greater risks. This is all super personal for me, because not far from where I grew up in Vancouver last year, there were a series of horrible floods which destroyed a ton of infrastructure and people's homes, not to mention washing out lots of different rail lines. And that's not to mention the forest fire smoke, which appears now every summer and used to never be an issue. Vancouver is oddly susceptible to natural disasters, so it will come up a lot in today's video. Now, from all of this, the question comes, how can we make our transit more resilient to the changing climate as well as other unpredictable natural events? Let's talk about it. Before we actually talk about making transit resilient, we should talk about what we're actually trying to make it resilient to. There are a lot of different potential things, but in today's video, I wanna focus on flooding, extreme wind, extreme cold and snow, earthquakes and landslides, and extreme heat. A lot of extremes here, it's not ideal. Fortunately, as it turns out, some solutions can help with many different things at once. For better or potentially for worse, one of the best solutions we have to improve resiliency from different climatic effects in the long term is to tunnel. I know I spend a lot of time on this channel talking about how we spend too much time tunneling transit, but tunneling actually might make a lot of sense from a resiliency point of view be it for rail or potentially other transportation modes, whether that be a pedestrian tunnel, even a cycling tunnel, or a high density BRT tunnel using trolley buses. Now, obviously tunnels protect from wind, but they also protect from things like track washouts, as well as from snow. And moderating heat can be a lot easier when you're underground, under the right conditions. Another big underappreciated thing is that tunnels tend to perform exceptionally well in earthquakes. And the analogy for why this is that usually gets brought up is that the ground is sort of like the ocean and an earthquake is sort of like a wave. I mean, it literally is waves. And so the amount of movement you see on the surface tends to be a lot more significant than underground or under the ocean surface in the case of the ocean analogy. I would actually argue that the lack of tunneling expertise and the lack of tunneled infrastructure we see in North America in particular is a big problem. A lot of the damage done to various railways and highways throughout British Columbia during those terrible floods and landslides I mentioned was likely due to the fact that we tend to build everything above ground here in North America, even if that means really steep grades, awkward curves, and all kinds of crazy cuttings. Whereas in Europe, it would be much more common to just have a ton of tunnels, whether they be on railways or on highways. And these tunnels are a lot less susceptible to things like landslides for obvious reasons. The way I see it, getting good at tunneling is just one of those things that we need to do as a society. It will help us a ton with various infrastructure, particularly in our cities, which are getting denser and need underground infrastructure, whether that be for transit, flood protection, utilities, or anything else under the sun. And for what it's worth, other parts of the world like Korea and Spain managed to build underground infrastructure for a fraction of the price of the English speaking world. So we clearly have a lot of work to be doing. Fortunately, there are also a lot of simpler, more targeted approaches we can use in the interim to make our transit systems more resilient. The first one worth addressing is flooding, which can be a huge issue for any city, and in this case, most cities, which are built anywhere near a river, a major lake, or obviously the ocean. All of this is made worse by increasingly unpredictable heavy rainfall and potentially large storms that lead to storm surge, a temporary raising of sea levels that's only going to add on top of the sea level rise we will already see because of melting glaciers and ice caps. Interestingly, on this particular topic, a lot of interesting solutions have actually come out of New York City, largely in the wake of the devastation to the subway system that was caused by Hurricane Sandy back in 2012. During the hurricane, a ton of different subway stations were flooded. And that's led to the MTA deploying a lot of deployable infrastructure that can be used to seal up subway stations so that the most vulnerable ones to flooding can be completely shut down and hopefully kept mostly dry during a major storm event. Now, the New York City subway does still have a ton of major water ingress issues, which you'll know if you follow anyone living in New York City on social media. It seems like every other day there's like burst water main or something else just dumping tons of water into subway stations. But it's exciting to see that the city is trying to do a lot to better protect the subway. In fact, your city might already be adopting a lot of the things we've learned about flood resiliency over the years. 
You know those grates that you often see on the sidewalk, which are used to ventilate subway stations or other underground infrastructure and structures? Have you ever noticed that more modern versions of these grates are often built on a bit of an elevated structure, kind of like a pedestal? The reason for this is that that raising of the grates prevents water from just pouring in during flooding or even just a heavy rain event. You actually also see something related in cities like Singapore, where the typical subway station design is raised up a foot or two from ground level so that during the heavy rainy season of the year, water can accumulate without directly draining into the subway station. These are the kind of design decisions that are really hard to retrofit, but with new built infrastructure, we should definitely be implementing basically everywhere to better protect our systems at very little cost. Back in New York, the hardening of infrastructure overall is also about damage control, and this is something I didn't really appreciate until the last few years. Ultimately, in a really bad storm, a lot of our cities and a lot of our infrastructure, particularly in a place like New York, is going to get flooded. That's something we just have to accept based on building cities so close to the ocean. The best thing we can do is help protect the infrastructure from nature so that after the flooding is over, we can bring the infrastructure back to full service as quickly as possible. One way this is being accomplished is with flood walls, which are exactly as they sound like. But another solution is to put things like electrical substations and other important equipment up on stilts so that even if floodwaters are to rise above the level of, say, tracks, they don't actually reach critical electrical systems. Windstorms are another major issue, without a ton of easy answers. Obviously, rail, tram, and bus systems with overhead wire electrification need to think carefully about making sure the gantries that support these wires are sufficiently strong to stand up to the most extreme winds. But another thing many transit systems do that they really should be reconsidering is letting trees grow so close to overhead power lines, and just transit in general. A good example in a difference in policy here can be seen between San Francisco and Toronto, both cities which are building new electrified rail systems. In San Francisco, the plan for Caltrain, which is again being newly electrified, is to allow trees to basically grow right up to the overhead wire gantries. They'll be trimmed back on a regular basis so they won't directly touch, but this policy decision makes the system more susceptible to a major windstorm knocking a tree over and damaging the overhead wires. By comparison, in Toronto, the policy now now is to not allow any trees within a certain distance of the rail corridor, planting only shorter shrubs directly adjacent. This is a bit of a more proactive policy, and it's the type of thing we should probably be doing in more places. I know it doesn't seem like a serious concern, but trees can do a ton of damage. A good example of this is actually again from Vancouver, where traditionally they probably let trees grow a little too close to the SkyTrain, and during one windstorm a few years ago, a massive branch fell and smashed the front of a train, did a ton of damage, and it's again a good reason to just not allow things to grow so close to major infrastructure. Extreme cold and winter weather is actually something we're gonna see a lot more of as well, even as the planet warms. And that's because the warming of the planet is going to throw off a lot of the predictable weather patterns we've traditionally had. And so when we see snow, we'll likely see a lot more of it and a lot more quickly. There's literally a winter storm going on outside as I'm filming this video. A great example really is just this year. Here in Toronto, which is traditionally known in Canada, at least for people from Vancouver, as a place that gets a lot of snow, has gotten almost no snow. Meanwhile, Vancouver, known as the temperate and mild climate place, has gotten a ton. These inversions of traditional weather patterns are really concerning, and a city like Vancouver just isn't designed for winter weather. Another good example of this is the terrible winter storm that happened a few years ago in Texas, where again, the severity of the storm wasn't even necessarily all that bad when you compare it to storms that places that are more used to winter weather get, but because Texas was not prepared for it, it had huge impacts. Now, with light to moderate snow, a good solution to keeping a transit system operating can be running the trains all night, and this is something that's pretty commonly done to keep the rails and other systems clear. Obviously, roadways are a bit more difficult with buses, but using snow tires where appropriate or potentially other solutions like tire socks can be a good way of at least trying to improve traction in snow and improve reliability. Now, in the case of heavy snow, more serious solutions might need to be used, such as a heavy-duty snow-clearing piece of equipment that operates on the rails. But there can also be more passive design solutions that are included in infrastructure, such as heated platforms that automatically just melt the snow off when it lands, or sprinkler systems sometimes deployed to keep snowdrifts to a minimum. 
Vancouver in particular has also traditionally faced challenges because the original SkyTrain system from the 1980s that was meant to detect if someone was on the rails so that trains would not operate into a station is based on pressure plates. And unfortunately, if a bunch of snow accumulates at the edge of the roof above a track and then falls onto it, well, it can set them off. To solve this, during the odd heavy snow day in Vancouver, SkyTrain attendants actually often sit at the front of trains and monitor for safety. This reduces frequencies, but keeps the system operating and keeps things safe. It's not ideal, but this type of solution is better than completely shutting your system down, which some cities do do. Another fun tidbit, the external sliding doors seen on SkyTrain do not work that well in winter weather, and so keeping them clear of snow and ice is a major consideration. And so during the worst days of the year, TransLink actually deploys people to a number of stations across the system with hockey sticks, yes, hockey sticks, to kind of get in between the door and the side of the train to keep things clear and to keep the trains running. I think it's also worth mentioning doing various treatments to your infrastructure, such as what I explored earlier this year with de-icing of trolley wires by applying a de-icing fluid. This type of proactive measure can mean that you might not have any major problems just because you invested a little time up front. I think the general lesson here is that we need to design our transit systems around less consistent and predictable climates, and to try to protect our infrastructure in every way we know how to, even if certain weather and climatic events feel less likely. There's an upfront cost to this, but the upside is that in a major disruption, you're left way ahead. When it comes to earthquakes, they aren't exactly new and aren't exactly getting worse. But it can be a particular problem in areas of the world that are susceptible to earthquakes but don't regularly get them that cities and infrastructure aren't all that prepared for when one actually comes. The obvious place to look to when it comes to making transit infrastructure resistant to earthquakes, as well as buildings and all kinds of other stuff, is Japan, where they have some of the best and most advanced seismic technical standards in the world. One of my favorite Japanese innovations is the automatic train stop during earthquakes. This is deployed most notably on the Shinkansen bullet train system and uses the earthquake early warning systems that are built off the coast of Japan to stop trains if an earthquake is detected, up to a minute before severe shaking actually begins. Not only does this keep people safe by preventing trains from derailing, but since trains travel so fast, it also protects the surrounding areas. Similar systems have actually been explored in places like Vancouver and Los Angeles, but what we really need is an open standard that all rail systems in earthquake susceptible regions can just deploy. That way, people around the world can respond consistently if an earthquake actually happens. Now, in any case, during severe weather or just a power outage, one feature that was historically part of rapid transit systems that should actually probably make a comeback is dedicated power generation, or in the modern context, power storage. The oldest rapid transit systems often had dedicated power plants to provide them high quality consistent power to run the trains. And it's still not uncommon to see small natural gas plants or at least some large generators to keep systems up even if the power grid goes down. The benefit of a full scale power plant being that you can keep the trains running even if there's a major disruption. And this approach can be further layered. Systems like Singapore are experimenting with putting enough battery capacity on their newest metro trains that if there's a power outage and power can't actually be delivered to the trains, they can still make their way to the next station and deboard passengers so that people can safely get out of the system and not be super inconvenienced. The last big problem, heat, is seriously underappreciated. You really see this with a place like London, which has had the heat issue forever and has been trying to solve it forever, and other cities are going to start to have heat issues in their subway systems as well, to a greater and greater extent. Heat is not only a huge issue for people's health, but it's also a huge issue for vehicles and other electrical equipment that operates in transit systems. A few ways to help reduce the natural ambient heat in a system is better ventilation, which is often easier when your stations aren't super deep underground, as well as things like more efficient electronics that give off less waste heat. You can also design stations in such a way that they're kept passively cool, and stations should also be actively cooled, something which is made possible by technologies such as platform screen doors. With regards to the impact of heat on infrastructure, one of the biggest issues we face isn't actually the heat itself, but the temperature swing. We actually already have tons of metro systems and even now high-speed rail in hot, arid, desert environments, so extreme heat isn't actually an issue for railways. What is an issue is swings from very hot to very cold temperature, the overall range of temperatures, which ironically is again a big issue here in Canada. 
For example, Ottawa has some of the most extreme temperature swings for any major city in the world. And this is a major issue because rails in particular expand and contract in the heat. If it's overly cold, rails can crack, but if it gets too hot, they can buckle. Increasingly varied temperature ranges means we might need to explore new materials for rails, as well as new designs for keeping them from buckling and allowing them to expand and contract without causing damage to other infrastructure. Now you might have actually heard about some countries painting their rails white, and this is to reflect sunlight and thus reduce the temperature of rails on the hottest days. But the issue is, like a lot of solutions you might see on the internet, this just isn't a panacea. A lot of countries don't actually do this because it can disrupt the ability to check the quality of your rails using ultrasonic testing equipment. Which is actually really important to maintain the structural integrity of the rails. Ultimately, I don't think any of these individual things is too much of a challenge for us to face. We have the engineering acumen to solve these problems, but we need to start seriously thinking about them and how they can be addressed. The good thing about transit when compared to roads from a resiliency perspective is it's highly centralized, so you can focus more of your energy on each bit of transit than you could with a road network. But the last thing we want is for our transit to be out of commission for any extensive period of time. And so make sure your city is thinking about resilience. Thanks for watching.